All right, let's start again. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. My name is Agnieszka Sovachinska. I'm the director of the Menzies Australia Institute here at King's College London. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, which is, of course, the 2023 Trevor Rees Memorial Lecture. The Rees Lecture is given annually in memory of Dr Rees, who was a distinguished historian of the British Commonwealth and Australia and reader at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, which was the Menzies home from 1982 until 1999. And it's my pleasure to acknowledge members of the Rees family in the audience here tonight. Each year, the lecturer is given by a distinguished early or mid-career scholar working on the history or politics of Australia. For those of you who have any familiarity with these two fields, um, previous Rees lecturers have included Stuart McIntyre, Frank Bongiorno, Joy DeMussi, Sherlene Robinson. The list could go on. Um, no pressure, Ruth. <laughs> Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Associate Professor Ruth Morgan to deliver the 2023 Reese Lecture. Ruth Morgan is the Director of the Centre for Environmental History at the Australian National University. She's a multi-award winning historian of water and climate in Australia and was also, um, and also and works on the Indian Ocean world more broadly. And she was a lead author in uh, the working group two of the IPCC's sixth assessment report. So that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Her latest book, Climate Change and International History, Negotiating Science, Global Change and Environmental Justice, will be published by Bloomsbury in early 2024. So there's a Christmas uh, <laughs> suggestion if you need hints. We're very, very thrilled to have her with us tonight. Can I ask you to please welcome Dr. Ruth Morgan? Well, thank you very much, Agnieszka, and thank you all for coming out tonight and braving the, the dreary weather. Um, maybe that's normal for you, but a little bit of an adjustment for me. And it's a real honour, of course, to be here this evening. And um, I also want to acknowledge the Reese family for their generosity um, for making uh, this opportunity happen. So get yourselves comfortable and indulge me for a few moments. In 2019, the Australian Minister for the Industry and the Environment, Daryl Ng, and the Foreign Affairs Minister, Lisa Curry-Kenny, dragged themselves back to Ng's room in the Kiribati Hilton. Down below, the warming ocean laps the beach almost two centimetres higher than it had when the first climate change convention met in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. It had been a long day. After eight years of tortuous ne negotiations, breaking the seven-year record set by the Uruguay, uh, round trade talks, this ninth meeting of the convention was expected to distribute the new global quota for greenhouse gas emissions amongst the signatories to what Australian Prime Minister Charlene Felizzi described as the most important international agreement ever. But as ministers arrived in this tiny Pacific country that few had heard of and fewer could pronounce, the Chinese and East Russian governments declared they would not accept the 10% reduction in global greenhouse gases endorsed six months ago by triumphant negotiators in Hanoi. The 10% target was a hard-won compromise between calls for a 30% cut from Western environmental groups and the nuclear power industry on one side and the no-change position taken by the Chinese, East Russia and radical scientists on the other. Some countries in the upper northern hemisphere had tacitly backed the no change bid because they saw benefits from a warmer world climate, but they had capitulated to pressure from countries with more to lose from a warmer world. Now, after a heated first session from which observers were excluded, the Chinese and East Russians had offered to accept a 7% cut staged over seven rather than five years with more research to be undertaken on the need for a 10% target the Australian ministers had to consider their response and gain the Prime Minister's assent. Once the decision was made, the Prime Minister would inform President Malcolm Turnbull. International greenhouse politics is leading inexorably to such a hothouse meeting in the first half of the 21st century. By then, Australia's 1990 commitment to stabilise greenhouse gas emissions at 1988 levels by 2000 will have been laughed at and long forgotten, and it would be time for real commitment. 
So this is from the Canberra Times, which is really a strange article about the head of the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics, Brian Fisher, who we might allude to later this evening. And I think when we talk about 1994 to 2019, we get a sense of the domestic political landscape uh, that was underway in the early 1990s. The very uneven experience of climate change. Uh, Foreign Minister Lisa Curry Kenny, for those of you who follow swimming, was very big in the pool back in the early 90s. But of course, the, the prospect of rising sea levels that is mentioned in that story remains ever potent, particularly for Australia's Pacific neighbours like Tuvalu, as well as in the Maldives, which actually held a cabinet meeting underwater a few years ago. So today I want to talk to turn to Australia and its Pacific neighbours, but working across different scales really in the region and then more broadly in the international negotiations of climate change. And it's been quite, uh, I suppose, an ex exciting opportunity for me to examine this region much more closely than I could in, in my book. And I think I sort of found myself as I was putting this book together that quite often we see in the scholarship a real focus or on climate negotiations at the expense of the wider context in which these negotiations are happening, as though they are somehow in a vacuum that the economy doesn't matter, that opinions don't matter, um, that there might not be a war going on at the same time. But also what we see, I think, when we turn to certainly Australia and the Pacific, are uh, real continuities. Um, and they often get overlooked when we change from government to government or from um, climate agreement to climate agreement. And I like to uh, take this moment to explore how that translates into the negotiations. So let's turn to that Pacific island nation of Tuvalu, which is on average about two metres above sea level and just four and a half metres at, at its highest point. It's responsible for just a tiny fraction of total carbon emissions, but it is one of the 198 parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The core objective of the convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations to prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. Among the parties, just five have been responsible for producing over half of the world's carbon dioxide emissions in 2021. That's China, the United States, India, Russia, and Japan. Low-income countries like Tuvalu together contributed just 0.5%. The main change to the top five since 1995, once the Framework Convention came into force, has been the rise of India, which helped to nudge Germany out of fifth place. Germany, together with the US, China, Russia, and the UK, has produced over half of the world's carbon dioxide emissions since 1750. And even if those emissions are arrested now, the climate will continue to warm as a result of past emissions. The amount and rate of even further heating depends almost entirely on human actions. So as a historical and present distribution of production emissions suggests, the human activity responsible for this heating has been concentrated in some parts of the world where the scale of fossil fuel consumption has begun to manifest in environmental changes elsewhere that are exacerbating the challenges that more vulnerable people already face. Based on the distribution of production emissions alone, whether we take that annually or cum cumulatively, the involvement of some nearly 200 other parties in the climate convention is a curious arrangement. Curtailing the emissions of the largest, say, five polluters, would surely go a long way to protecting the climate system as the convention seeks to do. One country might even do that alone. And successive Australian governments have pondered the situation in similar terms. Can Australians reduction, sorry, emissions reductions really make a difference when we see here that it's 1.1% um, cumulatively? Alternatively, the countries more vulnerable to climate change, such as Tuvalu, might impose emission limits on the biggest polluters. These observations beg the question, why engage the entire world to limit greenhouse gas emissions? 
That is, how did anthropogenic climate change become framed and understood as a problem that warranted the involvement of all states in climate diplomacy? And how has this approach afforded opportunities for states and others to advance their wider interests? Now, let me see what happens when I press the button. Here we go. We'll stay here. So the book that I've been working on is primarily concerned with why and how governments became conditioned to understand climate change as a problem that warrants ongoing international negotiation through the United Nations. The IPCC, which Agnieszka mentioned, was founded in 1988 under the auspices of the World Meteorological Organization and the UN Environment Program. Four years later, in response to a UN General Assembly resolution, which we'll come to in a minute, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed at the Rio Summit, the UN Conference on Environment and Development in uh, 1992, and that came into force in 1994. And the formation of these UN bodies was premised on the shared notion that the problem of climate change required the multilateral engagement of all nations, not just the largest polluters, not only the most vulnerable, not only the most populated, and not only the most scientifically well-resourced. As we'll see, whether it was ozone depleting substances or greenhouse gas emissions, diplomatic efforts to negotiate the reduction of atmospheric emissions have all encountered the same challenge of reconciling human and environmental benefit, often quite remote at geographic and temporal terms, with the fear of economic disadvantage under conditions of scientific uncertainty. And framed as such, this challenge has been among the defining features of climate diplomacy really since its inception. The largest polluters, historically the industrialized nations, are unlikely to bear the worst consequences of their actions. Since the late 80s, states have continued to pursue fossil fueled economic growth and the national development in the face of mounting scientific evidence of the need to abate greenhouse gas emissions. And it's really been only those states that can least afford this outlook that have seen the situation otherwise, and they have pressed their case in existential terms. And low-lying island nations have been especially vigilant. As we'll see, since the late 1980s, their unique vulnerability to rising sea levels and severe weather events has encouraged these nations to intervene in negotiations to strengthen the ambitions of the less vulnerable. In these negotiations to limit the impacts of present and future climate change, history has weighed heavily on the dynamics of international climate diplomacy. Under the terms of the Framework Convention, parties have common but differentiated responsibilities and res and pardon, different responsibilities and respective capabilities to address climate change. Led by the large industrializing nations of China, India, and Brazil, the Global South consistently argued that the problem of climate change was the consequence of the industrialization of the North. And having accrued the benefits of this fossil fueled process, they argued, it was incumbent upon those wealthy nations to reduce their emissions first and allow other nations to develop accordingly that greenhouse gas emissions linger in the atmosphere for decades was all the more reason for the industrialized nations to take that lead. What I hope to show is how negotiations regarding the global climate and anthropogenic climate change have often been and remain a continuation of politics by other means. And recognizing and probing these politics affords a clearer understanding of the challenges and opportunities of negotiating the climate. As historian Dipesh Chakrabarti has put it, quote, we can never compose our planetary collectivity by ignoring the intensely politicized and necessarily fragmented domain of the global that understandably converts scientist statements about humans as the cause of climate change into a charged discussion about moral responsibility and culpability. So let's go back to the 1980s. And by the late 1980s, climate change was already understood as a global issue. That is a common concern of humankind, according to the United Nations. But that framing had been a relatively recent development. They were building on foundations, of course, laid in the 19th century 
But most Western geographers and scientists only really came to define and measure climate in such global and di dynamic terms after the dawn of the atomic age. Recognizing that anthropogenic climate change could unfold within the space of a generation or two eventually arose from the intersection of atomic science, ecological thought, and Cold War internationalism. It was a kind of scientific framing of global climate that will always be remote from direct experience and require scientific mediation. New ways of thinking about the environment in planetary terms also afforded new ways of thinking about the relationships between humans beyond race and nation and between humans and the planet as either passengers or pilots of spaceship Earth. Now, while effectively powerful, this kind of one world thinking has proven elusive on the ground when it's come to climate negotiations. So I want to turn to the rise of climate change on the international agenda in the General Assembly. So here we have on the left, um, or my left anyway, uh, the foreign minister of Malta, Vincent Taboni. And in October, he put forward his government's case to the UN General Assembly for the conservation of climate as part of the common heritage of mankind. And he was nodding to Malta's uh, leading role in advancing the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And he argued that it was essential that action be taken on a global level to ensure that our planet remains fit to sustain life. He really foreshadowed the role of small island nations in the climate negotiations in the decades ahead. He expanded on the unique perspective of his country to these issues. Smaller states such as Malta, he argued, could contribute to the United Nations by ensuring the organization was constantly attuned to the growing and changing needs of mankind. He also argued that smaller states like his can reflect the conscience of mankind, which might have gestured to an address that the Maldives president, Mamoun Abdul Gayoum, had delivered to the General Assembly a year earlier. He's also on the screen. I couldn't find one from the late, late 80s, so this is him in the early 90s. Um, so President Gayoum had described the impacts of a recent series of tidal surges on the Maldives, elevating the problem of climate change to the UN for the first time since 1968. He presented an island perspective on the need for multilateralism to address this challenge. No one nation, he said, or even group of nations can alone combat the onset of a global change in the environment. And strikingly, pardon me, in that speech, he warned that if the sea was to rise by even a metre, such a rise will lead to a situation where a storm surge would be catastrophic and possibly fatal. That will be the death of a nation, his nation. So, so far, this has not been an especially Pacific or Australian story, so thank you for bearing with me. But as the interventions of the representatives of Malta and the Maldives uh, sink, sink, uh, sink in, they, they speak to important developments during the 80s that set the scene for the responses that followed. And what's also important about these two interventions was that they came from Commonwealth countries. Gayoum's address to the UN General Assembly in 1987 came very shortly after he had addressed the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Vancouver. He told his counterparts of the serious damage to the island nation following the highest tidal waves experienced for over a decade, where a third of its capital had been affected by severe flooding. He wondered with his colleagues whether this was a harbinger of problems that low-lying island states could face with growing frequency if the sea level continued to rise. The president of Bangladesh expressed a similar fear based on his own country's experience with coastal flooding and cyclones. And in response to Gayoum's address, the Commonwealth Secretary General, Sir Sonny Ramphal, established a Commonwealth group of experts to further investigate the issue. And some of you might be familiar with so Sonny, who uh, has quite a lengthy and storied career. But in terms of this story, he'd already um, been part of several rather important international commissions during the 1980s, the Brandt and Palm Commissions, as well as um, most directly relevant, the Brundtland uh, Commission on um, Environment and Development. And what's also significant about the Commonwealth group of experts that he gathers together is the contribution of Jim Bruce, who is 
um, who was Canada's um, vice president to the World Meteorological Organization. And he had been the secretary of the very important VILAC meeting in Austria in 1985, where the assembled scientists had called on governments to act on their findings, among them that the world's oceans might rise between 20 to 140 centimetres in uh, the coming decades. So that was a pivotal moment. And we have these Commonwealth figures um, playing leading roles in their identification. Now, the Brundtland report in the centre here sought to reorient the world towards the idea of sustainable development, that economic growth must be pursued with regard to future generations. And in that report, there's a rather large section on managing the global commons. And this is particularly significant for, for the Pacific, talking about fisheries and ocean dumping, talking about Antarctica, talking about climate change, and talking about ozone. But I want to pause here for a moment and note that these interventions are happening in a much wider context. And I think Australia's approaches to the governance of Antarctica and the ozone layer, as well as to the threat of nuclear winter, are particularly revealing for their approach, the approach that the Hawke government would take in the negotiations. Now, I've already mentioned Antarctica, which over the course of the 1980s, thanks to Malaysia and the non-aligned nations, had become framed beyond the Antarctic Treaty as a commons that might be better managed under the United Nations. By 1988, when Malta and the Maldives were um, making their own uh, pleas to the UN General Assembly, negotiations were well underway for a convention on the regulation of Antarctic mineral resource activities under the Antarctic Treaty. Despite the concerns of the likes of Greenpeace and others in the international environment movement, Australia and other Antarctic Treaty powers looked set to put pen to paper. But to everyone's surprise, the Hawke Labor government had a change of heart. Although Hawke, Keating and others represent this moment as an environmental awakening for their government, what is important to note is that Treasury had become concerned about the implications of Antarctic mining for Australians' own mineral production, as was the mining lobby. So this turnaround set the, set the stage, I should say, for the signing in October 1991 of a protocol on environment protection at a meeting of the Antarctic Treaty nations in Madrid, which banned mining activity for at least 50 years and designated Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. About the ozone policy. Well, in 1985, you might recall the British Antarctic Survey identified a hole had formed in the ozone layer, thus confirming the importance of ozone diplomacy that by now had arrived at the Vienna Convention. Australia was among the nations that was especially concerned with the depletion of ozone due to its implications for skin cancer, which would affect a great many fair skinned Australians. And I vividly remember being absolutely pasted with zinc as a child. Since the late 1970s, CFC propellants and aerosol products had been phased out and the Hawke government science minister attended the 1989 conference on saving the ozone layer here in London, which had been hosted by the prime minister, Margaret Thatcher, and at which Prince Charles called for a total and immediate ban on the production and use of CFCs. That meeting led to the important, important London Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which called on both developed and developing countries to phase out the ozone depleting substances over the next 10 to 20 years. Australia, without a significant chemical industry, was entirely supportive of this action on both CFCs and the newly concerning hydrochlorofluorocarbons. And finally, I want to mention nuclear winter which uh, was a theory that um, emerged from the very fierce Cold War rivalry, which res underwent resurgence during the 1980s. And Australians' uh, scientific fraternity found themselves right at the forefront of these investigations, trying to work out, did this theory hold, hold any water at all? And they certainly believed that it did. And the reactions to this nuclear winter theory not only presage the divisiveness that would also characterize political responses to climate change, 
but also set the scene for much closer attention to the Earth's changing temperature and vulnerability to human activity. And as you can see, if you can read the small text there, um, these interventions on um, nuclear winter that Australian scientists were making um, were really from the mid 1980s to the late 1980s. So these were the live issues uh, that were firing off just as the UN General Assembly responds to Malta and the Maldives. And IPCC and UN Framework Convention negotiations proceed from there. And what's key, I think, to setting this little scene up is that they give us a little bit of an idea of how those climate negotiations might proceed, not least in terms of the tensions between the governments of the global North and South and what the mechanisms of any treaty or convention might look like. So I want to turn to a pivotal meeting in um, the, the story, I suppose, of climate change, climate change's rise up the international agenda, and that's the Toronto Conference, which emerged directly from um, the hearings for the Brundtland Report. And during those hearings, Canada's Environment Minister had volunteered his government's enthusiasm, its willingness to host an international conference on climate change. And that would become the Changing Atmosphere Conference in 1988 in Toronto. And I don't think he could have anticipated the impact um, that that conference would have on establishing climate change on the agenda or on the efforts to impose ambitious thresholds to cut greenhouse gas emissions. So in June 1988, there were about 300 odd invited participants. There were the heads of state of Norway and Canada, because of course, Gro Harlem Brundtland was the prime minister of Norway um, by this time. And there were more than 100 other government officials gathering for this conference in Toronto. Just a week earlier, the group of seven industrial nations had endorsed the Brundtland Commission's concept of sustainable development at their own economic summit in the same town or city. And they encouraged the establishment of an intergovernmental panel on climate change under the auspices of the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization. And that would eventually become the IPCC. Their emphasis on international cooperation in an increasingly interdependent world was shared by those at this changing atmosphere conference, not least by Brundtland, who cited the importance of international agreements to the resolution of other atmospheric problems. International cooperation to manage and monitor the shared resource of the atmosphere was a key message in the conference's de declaration, and it urged, among its recommendations, the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions by approximately 20% of 1988 levels by the year 2005. And this would prove an incredibly arresting figure, an influential figure that would inform subsequent negotiations. But a heightening the urgency of the conference's uh, recommendations was its framing that the changing atmosphere had implications for global security. And this was stressed in the conference subtitle. And the declaration described the consequences of climate, ch climate change as second only to a global nuclear war with implications for global food security, political stability and species extinction. And in light of nuclear winter theories that were going around at this point in time, it also resonated rather strongly in the Pacific where in the wake of France's bombing of the Rainbow Warrior in 1995, uh, 1985, 13 members of the South Pacific Forum declared their region a nuclear-free zone, and both Australia and New Zealand were among the signatories. In Toronto, Sir Peter Marshall, the Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth Secretariat, outlined the preparations of that Commonwealth report that would be published a year later in 1989. Noting that the participating researchers were acting in their private capacities, he observed that the main concern of the group is with the probable developmental impact of climate change, with the practical steps that governments can take, and with the supportive and preventive measures that the international community as a whole can adopt. Sea level rise was, of course, a particular cause for concern for the researchers, not least in light of uh, President Gayoom's speech um, earlier in the year. So Peter shared the research gaps that researchers had encountered 
and they included the need for surveys, both physical and economic, of the impact that sea level rise could have on vulnerable low-lying areas. Little work, he said, seems to have been done on some potentially vulnerable low-lying areas like Guyana, Pacific Coral Islands, such as Kiribati, Tuvalu and Tonga, and the Asian deltas or low-lying areas, Bangladesh, China, Pakistan, among others. At the South Pacific Forum in Kiribati in July 1989, we'll go back to there in a minute, the Hawke government offered funding and research support to establish a network of sea level monitoring stations in the South Pacific, almost directly responding to the concerns that Sir Peter had uh, discussed in Toronto. And the concerns were also uh, reiterated at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malaysia, where governments issued the Langkawi Declaration. And they were also presented there with the Commonwealth Secretariat's report. And that meeting was just one of many conversations underway during 1989 between political leaders from both the developed and the developing worlds. At the Belgrade meeting of the Non-Aligned Movement in September, for instance, leaders agreed to call for the preparation and adoption of an international convention on the protection and conservation of the global climate on an urgent basis. India's prime minister for his part also advocated for a planet protection fund under UN control. So within the year basically of Malta presenting its proposal to the UN General Assembly, in late December 1989, a revised version of its resolution has been adopted by the UN General Assembly. Now it heeds the perspectives of the majority world and the resolution made clear that the developed world, having produced the pollutants, must take the main responsibility for combating climate change and provide the technical and financial assistance to developing nations. That had been one of the sticking points of the... Um, ozone negotiations that were underway at this point in time. The UN General Assembly restated the urgent need for governments to prepare a framework convention on climate change that would take into account both scientific knowledge and the specific development needs of developing countries. And most importantly, in terms of these questions of just how many nations should be involved, well, it was the General Assembly that was affirmed as the appropriate forum for political action on global environmental problems. And that has implications for the power of each country that is involved. Everyone has the same vote. Now these engagements suggest a rather conflicting role for Australia that had begun to emerge. On the one hand, they were playing an incredibly strong role on the international climate science scene, uh, not only contributing uh, research on um, nuclear winter, but to atmospheric science more generally, but also pursuing domestic or national interests in the policy space. Now, they were well aware that further research in the South Pacific region, where they wanted to set up the monitoring, was necessary for enhancing Australian scientists' understandings of the changes in their own neighbourhood, not least as they were aware that research in the Northern Hemisphere was only going to have a limited value in the Southern Hemisphere. So the IPCC, it had been established in 1988, it gets a real boost from Malta's resolution. And it continues to prepare its first report to inform a series of international meetings in late 1990 and early 1991, which included the Second World Climate Congress. The first in 1979 had um, discussed climate change and wanted more research. Well, now it's back on the agenda. By the time scientists and government representatives assembled in Geneva for this conference, some parts of the developed world, including Australia, had already taken steps to limit their own greenhouse gas emissions based on the Toronto target. Now, taken steps, they'd at least established a target. Um, actually, making those changes materialise has indeed proved more difficult. The US, though, which constituted over 20% of global carbon dioxide emissions in 1990, was not among them, but the Bush administration had by now conceded that it would engage in the negotiation of a framework convention on climate change. That was a bit of a breakthrough in itself. But with this conference in Geneva, the Second World Climate Conference, the same gentleman who had organized the Toronto conference was um, 
he must have done a good job because he was asked to, to organise this one as well. And he uh, attracted several heads of state to the event, King Hussein of Jordan, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister, um, the Prime Minister of France, and, of course, the Prime Minister of Tuvalu, Bikinebu uh, Pinu, who I probably butchered his name. Nevertheless, here we go. So for a small group of island nations, this conference was a real turning point for them in sharing their cause with the world. In 1989, the South Pacific island nations had met in Majuro in the Marshall Islands, where they discussed the potentially catastrophic changes that global warming represented for their countries. This was an existential problem. Another 14 island nations gathered in the Maldives, but their call for action had been overshadowed by the fall of the Berlin Wall just the week before. And Vanuatu's Ernest Barney had appealed to industrial nations at an IPCC meeting in Geneva to prevent us from becoming endangered species or the dinosaurs of the next century. So in Geneva, Tuvalu's prime minister seized the opportunity to remind delegates that we in the Pacific, the Caribbean and elsewhere had done the least to create these hazards, but now stand the most to lose. Ultimately, these island nations were pretty disheartened uh, with the pared back ministerial statement that followed the conference, but they did come away from Geneva, having formally or, uh, organized themselves as the Alliance of Small Island States. They had the legal support of a recently formed British group, the Foundation for International Environment Law and Development, which was formed here at King's. The island nations understood that their interests might be better served collectively as a UN bloc in the upcoming negotiations of a climate regime. They were led by the inaugural chair, Robert Van Leerop, who was a US civil rights lawyer and Vanuatu's ambassador to the UN. And the alliance would enter those climate negotiations armed with a newly salient precautionary principle, which had kind of uh, risen um, to significance, not least through the ozone um, negotiations, being invoked to counsel decision makers to take caution in advance of scientific certainty to protect the environment, to not delay to take action. As negotiations commenced, the Alliance put forward ambitious proposals that while quashed at the time, have since been reprised and are in the process now of being instituted. Chief among them was its 1991 proposal for an insurance mechanism to compensate the most vulnerable small island and low-lying coastal developing countries for loss and damage resulting from sea level rise. Vanuatu also submitted a proposal to curb fossil fuel subsidies, which have only recently returned to the negotiating table. The reports from Australia's delegation to these negotiations um, are quite revealing. For instance, they report in late 1991 that the objectives of the dominant ideologists of the South, India, China, Malaysia and Mexico relate less to the protection of the global environment than to the reversal of the imbalance of wealth between developed and developing nations through the acquisition of Western technology and financial assistance. They used, uh, they, they believed that what they were um, witnessing was an attempt to reprise the, the new international economic order agenda of the 1970s. But they also noted that there were significant differences between the developing countries that had emerged, particularly in the group of 77 plus China. And together, they did agree that only the developed nations should be reducing their emissions. But some nations in this group, such as the Alliance of Small Island States, and drought-prone African countries were generally wor genuinely worried about the adverse consequences for them of climate change, according to Australia's negotiators. Other developing countries, though, are concerned that the tough conditions proposed by India and other hardliners will prove unacceptably costly for the developed countries and thus deprive the poorer countries of the more modest financial and technology transfer likely to be produced by the convention. Now, as the negotiations unfolded, there was the issue of uh, targets and timetables on uh, the negotiating table, a target of emissions reduction by a certain amount of time. And we've already mentioned the Toronto target of uh, reaching 
um, by 2005, a certain reduction in emissions by 1988. And while parts of Europe were rather supportive of this approach, and certainly many of the developing countries were as well, energy exporters like Australia, the world's largest exporter of coal, was pretty lukewarm on the question of targets. And it followed that countries like Australia, like the United States, were home to proactive political lobbies that agitated for the protection of their fossil fuel industries from efforts to curb greenhouse gas emissions. And the influence of these lobby groups extended to the negotiations of the Climate Convention itself. For instance, the World Coal Institute, with Australia's support, helped to draft Article 4 of the Climate Convention, which provides for spe special consideration to those countries whose economies are highly dependent on producing or consuming fossil fuels. And their greater dependence on fossil fuels also encouraged a perception, which well-founded or otherwise, we could debate that, that reducing emissions are seeking, um, pardon me, reducing emissions and seeking alternative energy sources would be prohibitively costly. Whereas countries like Japan, some of the European nations were likely to interpret those policies in much more optimistic terms. Finally, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change arrives, they come to an agreement after a torturous process, they've rushed it through, and it's ready to be signed at the Rio Summit. And Australia's Environment Minister, Ros Kelly, has the honour of doing so, as you can see here. And this is often, I suppose, part of a, a wider or yeah, broader narrative um, about a shift in Australia's approach to climate change um, from the Hawke government to the Keating government um, when, when Keating finally um, manages to take on the prime ministership in 1991. But I think we tend to sort of miss some of the bigger shifts or changes that are underway at this point in time, where what had up until this point been a rather theoretical exercise, now there was the expectation of action should follow. There was also rather significant recession underway at this point in time, the recession we had to have, as Keating famously said. And of course, the Antarctic negotiations of the Madrid Protocol had um, were being wrapped up. And as I mentioned, the mining lobby and its threat to the Australian economy was part of Australia's position on putting a pin in um, allowing for the exploitation of Antarctica's mineral resources. So after this framework convention came into force, we won't we won't look at them just yet. Um, its parties gathered in Berlin for its first conference of the parties, and that was chaired by Germany's environment minister, a young Angela Merkel. They had gathered there to begin negotiations of what would become the Kyoto Protocol. Interestingly, the only draft that had been submitted for their consideration was from the Alliance of Small Island States. It had been drafted by Nauru's negotiators and presented by Trinidad and Tobago and it drew on the 1988 Toronto target. It was an ambitious proposal calling for a basic commitment of all parties taking into account their common but differentiated responsibilities and their, pardon me, specific national and regional development priorities. And this draft, after much wrangling, became the basis for the Kyoto Protocol, in which Australia, rather miraculously, was among only a handful of countries to negotiate an increase in its emissions relative to 1990 levels. This was quite a uh, breakthrough. So by the time the parties are gathering for the third conference of the Framework Convention in Kyoto in 1997, the coalition government had come to power under Prime Minister John Howard. The previous government had walked itself right back from its commitments to the Toronto target. And now the coalition sought to convince other OECD nations to adopt a principle of differentiated rather than uniform emissions targets. Environment Minister Robert Hill, who's pictured up here, told the Geneva climate meeting in 1996 that, quote, the challenge that now confronts us is to produce an outcome which will accommodate our particular economic and trade circumstances while contributing effectively to the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in a global sense. So he was suggesting that each country should have their own target um, in contrast to that Toronto target, which was advocating a 20% reduction across the board. 
As the Kyoto meeting approached in 1997, the Australian government took a rather bullish approach to the issue at the South Pacific Forum, where Pacific Island nations hoped to set the scene for an ambitious outcome to the negotiations, calling for binding uniform cuts for greenhouse gas emissions. In Rarotonga, however, Prime Minister Howard flatly refused the proposal and forced a last minute renegotiation of the forum's official communique. After the meeting, Tuvalu's Prime Minister, Pinu, told the press it was just a win by John Howard against 15 nations. Being small, we depend on them so much. We had to give in to what they wanted. So let's return to those questions that I raised at the beginning of my talk about the structure of the international system of climate governance. Questions that reflect wider concerns about its successes and failures, not least as we approach the global stock take of the Paris Agreement, the successor to the Kyoto Protocol. Protocol eventually came into force in 2005, but the absence of the United States and Australia and the continued rise of greenhouse gas emissions led European countries and the small island states to seize on the security implications of climate change to raise international ambitions for what would follow Kyoto. So really reprising some of those arguments that are being made um, in Toronto in 1988. Those efforts included Germany and the UK's elevation of the issue of climate change to the UN Security Council, much to the um, uh, outrage from some of the developing countries, while some Pacific islands turned to the International Court of Justice where Tuvalu had threatened in 2002 to sue Australia and the United States over the impacts of climate change, but they did not proceed with that litigation. But there are other, other efforts in the works. So Australia is now facing increasing pressure from within its own territories to take accountability for its historical emissions. Traditional owners in the Torres Strait, which is to the north of Australia, Australian continent, I should say, have taken the Commonwealth to the federal court over its alleged failure to sufficiently reduce emissions and meet its duty of care to the peoples of the Torres Strait. Given the efforts of the nation's Pacific Island neighbours to urge more ambitious approaches to mitigating climate change, I expect those governments will be watching these proceedings closely. Thank you.